Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to go on to the next scenario, but I think just as a, the observer moderator, like it's interesting how immigrant stories have those push pulls to them, you know, the push towards it or the pull away from it at different moments. And I feel like all of you have those kind of, you know, right time, right moment type of scenario within it. But, um, but maybe we can pick this up later. So our third scenario, um, and I'm going to go to Zane first is to have you discuss your professional life and discuss one time that you became very aware of your race. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess this is not necessarily a racial identity or question of sorts, but early on um, in my career, after my first, I remember after my first record kind of made like a little bit of a surprise splash. I had um, a conversation with a, somebody who's very highly placed at a label who, you know, brought me in one day to do the whole, you know, talk that you do, the whole kind of wine and dine that people do when they're, when they're, when they're trying to get young blood into, into their ecosystem. And um, there, it was, it was a lovely conversation for the most part, but towards the end of it I remember um it came up there, there was just various things about this is what's interesting about the story this is what's interesting about the narrative um what about what about uh you know I don't know hope, hopefully this is not like intruding or anything but like might I ask what your religious background is I was like yeah I was I was raised Muslim and I, I still practice it in my own way um why and uh they said why is that not part of your press sheet? Why don't I see that anywhere in your bios? That's one of the most important parts of, of, of this working. And I was like, wait, 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 in what way? And he was like, I know you're not gonna wanna hear it, but this is like a branding opportunity. And um, I think there's just something weird when you talk about it in that way, where it's so plainly is like, I know everybody has to find a way to work in the market and do the commodification that's required to make an ecosystem like a label survive. But I think to come into um, a conversation and an initial let's get to know one another that is so laden with terms of finance and of branding with regards to something that is really like under threat and constantly under attack in America just feels, it, it just, it's just brought up a lot of um, questions of, okay, whose interest, even if these guys are working on the behalf of artists, whose interests are they actually looking out for? And how much um, self-work are they actually willing to do to not sound so incredibly clumsy with their language and their priorities here? Um, I think one good thing that is, about that, though, is also that, like, I think there's, there's one half of, of people I know South Asian, Asian who are like, yeah, yeah, it's great. You should use it, use it to your own advantage, use it how you want. And then there's the other half that are like, hey, well, at least you got to see that really early on in initial conversation. And you got to know that that's somebody who you don't want to build with. Um, so yeah, I'm glad I had that, that kind of realization early on. Ben, it's coming to you. Oh. Um, so when I, yeah, when I hear that question, it, uh, it kind of suggests that uh, there's some sort of um, negative connotation, you know, about uh, people looking at you and making judgments based on your appearance. Um, but I've, and I certainly went through a lot of that when I was a kid, uh, growing up in Boston, especially, um, maybe less so in Vermont, but as an adult, I feel pretty fortunate that I haven't, I haven't really run into that very often. I think just because as a musician, you're in a community of, of uh, people who are from all over the world and 
are um, all different. That we're just different people <laughs> from the rest of of society. I feel uh, it's kind of a niche, you know. Um, uh, but there was one. So occasionally, uh, I will get um, uh, a call for something that's clearly based on uh, we need a certain type of looking person for this event. It says it's running. Um, but uh, recently, I got called for this this um, this show uh, that was put on it at the public theater called Soft Power, which is about uh, Chinese uh, immigrants in the U.S. It's really uh, it was sort of the the story of um, the playwright David Henry Huang, and uh, so there was a a call for an orchestra of. Uh, that had to be on stage. And many of us were Asian, not all of us, but it was really wonderful. It was really wonderful to be in, uh, in a community of Asian Americans on stage. Um, and I became very aware of my, my Asian-ness, I suppose, uh, not just as part of the show, but um, part of the, orchestra we would we would uh we had our own dressing room and everyone would bring in their favorite asian dish you know it could be like um pocky sticks <laughs> it could be uh uh senbei or um and and it just became like this oh yeah yeah that's right yeah i remember having that when i was a kid or you know my grandpa my grandparents house or um and sharing stories, it was really uh, great to be, I mean, I suppose in a way I was profiled because I was Asian, but it was, I feel like in this case, it was really for uh, an Asian audience. And uh, the show was fantastic. Um, I related a lot to um, the, the central character who is sort of torn between um, Growing up in a a uh, in a neighborhood where uh, everybody thought he was culturally Chinese, but he didn't really have any of that going up, and then later on being called to be part of this Asian production and not really being able to offer that to it either. So he was kind of caught in this. What am I? You know, am I Asian? Am I American? Um, it was really kind of the central uh, question of that show. And uh, I feel um, that a large part of my life has been, you know, dealing with that question. So I suppose, I suppose uh, that was one event recently that I was very aware of my race, but in a very positive kind of way. Um, so when I saw this question, I, I thought a long time on this question too, because I, I, I didn't know if I should talk about the negatives of it or the positives of it. Um, you know, of course, being, you know, a woman and being Asian and being short, <laughs> it's, it's really hard um, in, for people to take you seriously. Um, on what you do. I mean, I tell people I, I teach orchestra and they, they look at me and they want to pat me on the head and say, oh, that's cute. That must be so fun that you get to just play with music all day long. And, you know, they don't, they don't understand that, you know, we're doing rehearsals and I'm teaching rehearsal etiquette and dealing with, you know, 50, 60 kids at a time. And it's, I mean, it's not all fun and games. Um, but then I also thought about the positives of it, and I thought about um, something that happened like two or three months ago, right before the right before the pandemic happened. Um, a student of mine, she came up to me and she said, um, "Hey, Miss Sue, like I don't I don't think I can do orchestra next year because my dad won't let me." And I said, "Well, why won't he let you?" And um, she told me that 
you know, I have to choose between basketball and an orchestra. And um, my brothers think I should do basketball instead of orchestra because that'll look better on my college resume because all Asians play something in orchestra and there's very few Asians in basketball. And I was like, well, are you even on the basketball team right now in middle school? She's like, well, no, but you know, I'm gonna trial for basketball in high school. And I mean, I, I didn't want to say it, but I mean, and I didn't, <laughs> and I think she knew too, but I mean, if, if you're not successful in basketball now, you're not going to be later on, but she's a really, really good cellist. And, you know, if that's where her happy place is, is in orchestra. And that's what she was telling me. She feels like that's where she belongs. And, you know, that's, um, that's what she should be doing. And, um, and I told her, well, then you, you really should do orchestra. And she's like, well, I don't know how to talk to my dad. I'm first generation Chinese. And my brothers are the ones that are like telling him what I should do with my life and stuff like that. And, and, um, and I was like, well, I'm also first generation Chinese too. And I just wanted to like grab her and, and help her because, you know, all I saw when she came to me was like, me 20 years ago <laughs> and um you know i i grew up with that too my parents didn't speak english they didn't know um what was going on in my school life because they were busy with work all the time and um and so she and i we really bonded and you know i gave her some tips on you know how to talk to her parents and how she really should stand up for herself and what she wants to do and um and I, I understand it's hard for her right now especially since you know she's 13 or 13 or 14 right now and you know and i told her it's okay that you're scared right now but just remember you know you just you need to stand up for yourself and you need to do what makes you happy and um and i think she's continued to talk to her dad and her brothers and um uh, we're still trying to work orchestra back into her schedule um but but i i feel like you know i was able to help her and because i was able to connect with her and um you know growing up i i didn't really have asian american teachers that i could bring this up to so i i felt like that was really awesome that i could relate to her because I felt like our stories were so similar. I'm going to just say that um, being a musicologist who works in a discipline like an academic field that is still predominantly white and at universities that are predominantly white institutions, race is a constant sort of everyday feature like being aware of race and, and power is something that um like you know could take up the rest of today and tomorrow and the next week uh, you know like examining that uh, but i will say you know like my previous so you know, this question's about how race intersects with our professional lives and what we've been really aware of it my before i came to george washington university um i taught at the university of oregon for eight years um which is a very you know white institution and um I mean, I could tell you about the one colleague who would uh, yell out uh, Kajikawa sensei every time he saw me in the hall. Um, but I think the, the one time that it really, um, I really had to think about how I was being perceived based on, on race was, um, I'm, you know, I actually I didn't mention this in my introduction, but I'm, even though I have worked with Asian American musicians and written about Asian American musicians, um, I'm primarily known as a scholar of, of hip hop music and wrote a book called Sounding Race and Rap Songs that really deals with how hip hop music, how, musically, like through the beats, not just lyrics or, or video imagery, but how beats themselves um, are part of how racial um, race is constructed in the genre and, and really look at the musical elements of the racial, um, racial representation. And um, so I've read a lot about blackness and, and, and which is a, such a huge part of, of race in the United States. And of course I teach, a, a, every year I teach a class um, 
about the history of hip hop, which is a, a popular class because it's such a, you know, students have such a, a, an, a already, and they come to come to university with an interest in the music and want to take advantage of the opportunity to learn more about it. And so I was the, the first time I actually taught that class at the University of Oregon, um, I wanted to have a, a week um, where we talked about hip hop outside of the United States. Um, and because we've primarily been telling a, a very, you know, standard US centric story of the genre. And I just read um, a, a book about hip hop in Japan by a scholar named Ian Condry, who's at MIT. And um, I was like, well, this is perfect. He's got, he has, even has a website that's got videos with translations into English. And, and it just made my job of, of, of choosing this sort of easy. And I got totally hammered by a couple of students on my teacher evaluations at the end of that semester who assumed that, who basically wrote things like I was trying to, like I, I was wasting time in class that we could have been talking about more important artists on, you know, pushing my sort of cultural agenda um, on the class with these, this, this Japanese hip hop. And of course, like as a fourth generation Japanese American, like I, my Japanese is not good enough to even understand what Japanese rappers are saying. I mean, it's, it, it's like I'm just a, as much an outsider to hip hop in Japan as any other like American hip hop fan who would approach that music. Uh, and so, you know, but, but what they were assuming was based on my last name, based on what their perceptions of, of me racially, that um, I had some ulterior motive for wanting to occupy class time with this topic, that it wasn't a topic that was worthy of consideration or that an, uh, another instructor would have necessarily put on the syllabus. And so, um, that was an interesting moment where, um, you know, my professional world and sort of racial identity um, intersected and, and made me question like how students perceive me and what I need, you know, how, how uh, I might need to think about negotiating um, the introduction of a topic like that in the future. Yeah, I think it's interesting, Lauren, in, in some of these other ways is how much do you reveal of yourself in your professional life, right? I think all of you have kind of addressed that, you know, whether you're Muslim or whether you're, you know, you, you don't overtly see it or you know that it's always there, you know, like I think there's that. Um, and then how much you were personally comfortable about it because I, um, my name is Jennifer Wilson, but I'm biracial Chinese American. So, you know, like, do you see it? Does it matter? Right. you know, what is it, what does it say? Mm -hmm. um, really interesting, really interesting in these different realms that you all have brought up. Um, anyone have any thoughts that you wanted to, or shall we keep going? What do you think? I don't know. I mean, I would be in favor of keeping on going, but then opening things up after we learn more. I mean, it's so fascinating learning, um, about everybody's own experiences and, and perspectives. And I think you're, you're doing such a great job of pulling out these themes that I, I think really are, are common to all of our stories here, where sometimes, you know, race can be something that, you know, is about what you reveal, but it's also about what people might expect, you know, from you. And do you want to use that as an, are you comfortable using that when it's advantageous to you? Or also when is it potentially you know, something that's gonna stand in your way or make, make your life diff more difficult and complicated. And I think that sort of double-edged nature, you know, to race is very much a part of, uh, I think a lot of the, the stories that, that, that we just shared. Yeah, well, our last scenario, um, moving on and then opening up as we have time, because I realize the East Coast people, it's after nine, right? Um, I already told you I don't go to bed. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. 